today we kind of start in the session slowly so the others will join uh, so in the last week uh, we discussed on uh, web security so we discuss two things you remember web security and web application security web security refers uh, uh, two things application level and the transportation level in the transportation level, there is a protocol called TLS. We discuss in detail how this TLS works. And for the TLS, uh, there is a need for what we call it as public key certificates. We also discuss how this, how we could generate public key certificates and how to use those public key certificates in uh, web servers and the browsers and so on. Then in the after that, we discuss on application level uh, and web application vulnerabilities. And in the meantime, I was also demonstrated how someone uh, do man in the middle attack on these web applications. And also, we discuss how to avoid those problems and so on. Uh, today, I want to uh, move on to some other topic uh, that's what we call it as privacy, especially in the point of web users. So we are nowadays facing a serious problem of privacy. So since uh, most of the time, like we are in the Asian part of the world, the people in the Asian countries are not so concerned on privacy. Uh, so because of that, in the large scale, privacy of power get violated by most of the uh, companies. So since that privacy get violated, that open up another problem. So we will discuss towards the end what we call it as open source intelligence. So, so I will define what open source intelligence means and how it works and so on and so. So basically, the, since we don't concern on privacy, some people might use our information or the public domain to collect intelligence or collect uh, whatever they want on by looking at our personal data so in the one side if you have proper privacy there may not be a topic called open source intelligence because if we don't violate if the companies don't violate our privacy plus if we concern on privacy then we may not put our personal information to the open space or the cyber space so if so then people may not be able to collect intelligence so, so these topics are kind of to contradict kind of each other. So maybe in my lecture also sometimes I may contradict each other, but let's look at that two problems where exist right now on the cyberspace. Right. Let's first look at that, the privacy. What are the threats to the privacy in this modern modern era or what we do right now? So we can see legal threats plus illegal threats to the privacy. Legal threats means we are legally or by our concern uploading or providing the privacy information, the private information to a cyber space. So maybe some company collected our personal data while registering such as email address. So we are not concerning about too much on those information and the company may sell that to some other company. That is kind of privacy violation. And you might use some location apps such as like Google hang on sessions, Google, Google traffic apps and so on. So if you use such apps, uh, then these companies may collect location information. And so those again violating our privacy. So what we are using our Google uh, applications or traffic whatever so we are legally using it and we are we legally give our consent to collect private information to those applications and so like that so to the cyberspace we voluntarily give our personal information to get some services so those may violate our privacy on the other hand, there are illegal problems, illegal threats. That means someone may intercept connection, 
someone may put a kilo, someone may execute man in the middle attack and may collect the, our personal information. So that also a threat to privacy. So as I understood the most, the larger, whatever most uh, available kind of threats right now to the privacy is legal threats. We personally give unwanted information to the cyberspace without thinking. So comparing to the illegal threats, actually legal threats are much larger. Right. What kind of privacy violations we can see? Especially, you know, all the current online services, they are collecting our personal data. So they usually tell us, they give a free service to us. So whenever an online company says a free service, you should know you are not paying using money, but you are paying by using your private information. So kind of you are the product. If you are not paying them, if they are providing the free service, so that means you pay somehow to them. So how do you pay? You pay using your personal information, using the data. So I personally believe there are no free service on the cyberspace. So you may not agree. So for example, like Facebook, let's take Facebook. So they say forever it's free. It's not free. So you are working for Facebook free of charge. How do you work for them? You, you work for them by uploading the data. Your photos, your posts, your comments, your likes. So those data collected by Facebook and sell it and earn money. So you kind of work free to them. So it's, they are not offering free service. Actually, you are work for them free. So, and most of those companies not really concerned on your privacy. They only concern how do they make money on top of user, selling the user information to the different marketing companies, government agencies, politicians, as well as the hackers. And they also trace track you, they also per personalize you and do what they call it as personalized marketing. And the other thing what you should not think about, basically on the internet, if something gets leaked, it cannot revoke. So you might think, you might put some photo to your blog or maybe to your Facebook and later on you might delete that. And you believe that got deleted. It not. At that time, maybe some other people may download. Maybe some internet archiving website may take a copy. Maybe internet caching website may already cache those information. So like that. So there are no reward or no delete button on the internet or the cyberspace. So if you upload something to the cyberspace, it's forever. It get linked into the cyberspace, it leaked, cannot return or cannot reverse back. So because of that, you need to be really, really concerned before using the cyberspace or before uploading the personal information to the cyberspace. Let's look at some case studies or kind of the studies which do by some other people and what they say before I come to what I say. In that. So, for example, the RSA laboratory has published this picture and they, they, they concern on the user privacy. So, for example, in the future, you know, most of the goods are uh, tagged using RFIDs or maybe uh, using kind of uh, QR codes and things like that. Uh, let's say somebody, Mr. Jones, who buy a wing and that tagged by the RS. Uh, uh, by uh, RFID, RFID tag. So, so, so while he buying that, assume he paid to that using his credit card. So if he paid, if you were to a person who paid at a supermarket or at internet or wherever using your credit card, your purchase is buying to your identity. 
So whoever basically sell that knows who you are because your credit card number has your identity. So with that, they could link you to the product you purchase. Then after that, if somebody wants to trace you out, they just need to search for this RFID. So for example, if the Mr. John, my example, by a wing using his credit card, then whatever government agency or the tra person who wants to trace him knows, uh, find it out, okay, here this ID, RFID is, belongs to Mr. John. And if later on, if he only, if he wants, or she or he wants, or the authority wants to trace Jones, so they just want to trace this particular ID. Then that agency knows, okay, this guy is attend to that, this place, that place, and these activities, and so on and so forth. So that is kind of tracking problem. So that is kind of privacy violation. So, so we are voluntarily give our credit card detail we have to because to pay to uh, authorities, so which then links to our purchase. So those purchases may lead to the privacy issues later on. So you might ask some, how about we pay by cash? So if you pay by cash, that is anonymous. That means if you buy something and pay by cash, so then no one doesn't know your identity. But you know, especially in these supermarkets, uh, most of the countries, they do a small trick for that. So they issue special cards to their customers, what they call it as loyalty cards. The purpose of loyalty cards, again, for tracking the people. So if, even if you pay by cash, in order to get this loyalty coin, you, you scan or you touch or you, you, you give your loyalty card. So that link your identity to what you purchase. I respect you, your payment method. So again, you ended up with the tracking problem because this supermarket or the person who wants to trace knows this person has brought these products. So that is a violation of privacy. Similarly, there is another case study, you know, some of the European countries, they have implemented smart metering. So smart metering created the serious privacy issues, especially in Europe. So as you may aware, most of this electronic equipment has something called power signatures. Power signatures means where they consume power. So for example, your AC refrigerator and washing machine has a pattern of using power. So let's take example as washing machine. In the washing machine, you know there are some phases, washing phase, drying phase, and so on. So each phase, the power they need is different. So people has already kind of recorded power consumption of the different uh, brands and they have tried it out using AI technologies, which brand it is. So for example, if I measure the power consumption of your home, and over the time I could know, so this machine operate, because each machine has the known power consumption levels. <coughs> That's what we call it as power signatures of the device. So there was a case in Europe somebody has taken power consumption of some city and they publish a paper saying each house in that city use washing machine at that time, uh, cooker at that time, uh, whatever the bathroom heaters at that time, and so and so. Some might ask, what is the issue with that? So basically, in, in principle, there are no issue we can see, but if the privacy point of view, there is an issue because people can, surveillance, people can know when, where are you right now at that time. Are you at the bathroom or are you at the kitchen? Are you sleeping? Or are you at the home at all? Like that. So people could do some level of surveillance on the other people by just looking at the power signatures of the electronic equipment. That is again some privacy problem. 
Let's move on to our case, cyberspace. Cyberspace main entity which violate the privacy social networks, as you may know. In the social networks basically collect quite a lot of our private information. And most of these social network providers, they don't concern on the, these privacy of users, instead they treat us as their products. They sell us to the different people. Uh, as I said, in the especially for social networks, when you upload something, it's forever. It's never completely deleted. They keep story. So you might say delete your photo, but it may not be visible to you, but that photo is still with social network company. Maybe at that time someone has may download that. At that time, this net social network soft company has sell it to someone else, like that. So using these social networks, and since we are uploading our personal information to those networks, so some other groups use that to violate our privacy. So for example, maybe employers, uh, universities, Tax authorities, law enforcement authorities, and government intelligence agencies, hackers, insurance companies might use the data we uploaded to our to cyberspace to to find it out who I might. Especially, you know now, most of the IT companies when they recruit uh, software engineers, they are not asking reference letters from the professors anymore. Instead of, they just check their social identities. They just check on the social networks of the particular person to gauge, to measure their abilities, their attitudes, and their friends, and so on, and then decide whether this person to be hired or not. There are so many current cases, even in Sri Lanka, maybe in your countries as well. So the, some employers get fired out from the companies since he has posted some things to the uh, uh, Facebook. So that is, may not match with this company interest and things like that. So if you just focus on the Facebook, uh, it will work a little bit, you might interest on how many people use Facebook and so on. So I have given a link here on top. So you can, that's it, most of the people to use for find it out Facebook statistics. So you can check with that, uh, the usage of Facebook in your country. Usually the Facebook users are very high in Asian countries. The, the China, you know, has banned the Facebook, but they have a Chinese version of Facebook different application, which is similar to Facebook, run by Chinese companies, and of course, Chinese government. But most of the Facebook uh, users are from India. And there are quite a lot of Facebook users from Bangladesh, as well as in Sri Lanka. So the Facebook treat, or Facebook kind of address, the user requirements, what we call it as kind of as humans, basically we would like to know the information of each other. So the Facebook basically address that. So we knowing or without knowing, thinking or without thinking, we upload our personal information to the Facebook. So some of this information we should not publish. We give all lot of information what we want. Our name, age, sex, what we do, our ID numbers, our photos, our medical information, everything. So then uh, the bad guys and then whatever the people who want to trace us actually collect all those information. Sometimes they pay the social network companies and buy those information. Uh, so that information we don't know who accessing it, 
and we don't know what kind of things they might do with this information. Let's take a simple example I always take, and I always like to give you an idea about these simple examples. So uh, I know most of the Asian people, young people, they like these selfies and then upload those selfie photos to Facebook and other uh, photo sharing sites like Instagram and so and so. So let's say you, you had a nice vacation, you went, you have gone for a vacation, some remote areas in your country or some other country and has taken very beautiful selfies with nice backgrounds and so and so. So usually I notice most of the young people, soon as they took those selfies, they uploaded those photos to the Facebook Coinstrum or any other photo sharing websites like Flickr. Flickr. So, so what we, our assumption is there to share these nice photos and our achievements to our friends. So we assume all the people who follow us on those Instagram or Facebook are our friends. How do we know that? They are not. They are, might be theft, there might be intelligent agencies, there might be some other people following us on those. Let's take you two photos, as I said, in the remote area and upload it to the Facebook. On the security point of view, what that says? That says you are not at home. So if someone follow you knows you are in that remote area and your home is there without anybody in there. So this is a good opportunity to bad guy to break into your home and take whatever available there because they surely knows you are not at home because you just post a photo from a remote area with the entire family. Is that correct? So can't you wait till you come back to home to publish that? You can, but we are not doing it. But we are not doing it. So that is what we have to think. So all those companies, including Facebook, has what they call it as privacy policy, but we never read that. And what they do is they look at us. We, we are looking at Facebook, they are looking at us and following us and use our private information and violate our privacy. So without thinking that you for your life, you are uploading information to those social networks. Then as I mentioned, the data you uploaded today may fit in five years time. So like this cartoon says, if you go to an interview, that whatever the HR person may ask a question like here, which shows in this. So how do they know about that? Perhaps you have uploaded a photo someday, maybe with your boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or whatever friends. So we are, without thinking, that get leaked. And when you come to the interview at HR, usually most of the people who interviewed in the HR, especially in the software companies, I know, especially in Sri Lanka, they search the social networks and make sure who you are, what kind of people who you are, what kind of people you, and what, who are your friends, and things like that. They don't want any reference anymore with these non-relative people because social networks give good reference to you about you because you have given all your private information to these untrusted companies. That is really serious. So other serious problem is your location. Thinking or without thinking, you have shared your location information. So those information you believe these companies are not using, but they are using it and they are selling it. So what's happened if someone hacked into these databases? 
they might take all those. So those location information, most of the time, you give it voluntary. You give it voluntary. Not only your information, sometimes you are giving someone else information as well. So, you know, like Google Map, there are places you can mark. So you voluntarily mark someone else's places. So you, you actually give a new private information plus you give someone else private information as well to the public, to the cyberspace. So that create serious problem in the future. So in the future, basically, so we, we all rest, we all rest. So for example, the big example is Google traffic apps or Google transit apps, whatever. So when you open that, what's happened? So they take your location, they access your acceleration sensors. So those information, they get recorded. And then using that, they give the service to someone else. As long as they keep this information private, that's fine. So I'm telling that some, if someone gets into their servers and hack into that information, then what happened to you? So that you have to think about. So you understand, I think, seriousness of privacy and privacy violation and the problem of voluntarily giving private information to the companies without thinking. So similarly, so if you understand this problem, you definitely ask how do you protect ourselves? How do you kind of uh, make sure uh, we preserve the privacy? So for that, there are several technical controls we can take it, plus there are legal controls we should take it. So in principle, you have to think about not to give any private information or the, any personal information to those cyberspace, not to upload, right? So before you upload, you have to think that photo may not keep any problems to me today as well as in the future. So you have to think that doesn't matter. This photo get leaked. So it's anyone can look at that, doesn't matter. Let's then upload. Otherwise, don't do it. And the other thing is when you browse on websites, uh, you may, you should understand that this website knows uh, where are you from. Sometimes we may, we don't want to do so. Sometimes we don't want to do so. Then, how do you kind of assure uh, the privacy? So that there are tools available, what you call privacy and knowledge tools. We look at a few of them. Plus, there are laws. Recently, a few months ago, you know, the European Union enforced a very good law to protect the privacy of their citizens. So that's called a general data protection regulation to the European Union called GDPR. So that concern on the privacy of European citizens. So all the big social network giants got big fine by violating those regulations. So if you do any software, any products in, to Europe, you need to be kind of follow this regulation. If you violated it, there is a huge fine. So you, most of the social network companies has already fine with the big money since they have violated those regulations. But as you may understood, most of the Asian countries, they don't have such privacy regulations. So, so those international social network companies are then freely violating our privacy, freely kind of taking advantage of us, really selling us to some other people. So 
that's legal file side. So in the technology science, there are some tools. There are some uh, tools available uh, where we ha can use uh, to basically to stop taking our information. There are encryption tools to protect our personal information. There are anonymizing tools and kind of anonymizing browsing tools and so and so. I'll mention a few of them, so maybe if you wish, you can use them. So when you start from keeping protected data on your devices, infinite encryption tools you have to use. So there are open source plus commercial tools available. So one of the tools, very popular a few years ago called Proofit, it was kind of stopped. And there was a clone called Veri Veracrypt. And there are commercial tools if we use in those their systems. There is a BitLocker. And if you have Linux systems, Linux based system, there is a tool called Lux. So, like that, there are disencryption tools that are maybe very useful to protect private information. So, someone might ask, why do you protect our This is not cyberspace, right? So it's not, but you have to think about it. So let's take your phone, for example. So in Sri Lanka, there are so many cases. So, so people has given their phone to repair. And the people who work at these repairing shops has taken the photos on those phones and upload to the Facebook and sometimes threaten to the owners and take hands up. So if that information get encrypted, even we have given the phone to those people, they may not be able to see that. If that information is just as plain, if you've given your device to some places, repair so for example, they might misuse that. They might use that information to blackmail you. That's privacy violation. They might post that to their Facebook. So that may kind of finish your life in some situations. So maybe if you have really confidential information, better to do encryption and store them. And similarly, email. People think email is a secure way of communicating. I have a separate lecture in the coming weeks, so I will discuss email later on. And we have already discussed TLS and VPNs and so on. So I already showed, even we consider TLS as secure, there are some kind of problems there as well, but uh, you have to use at least those tools. I mentioned that TrueCrypt, so I still there are millions of people use TrueCrypt, TrueCrypt as a open source tools to protect your hard disk or the file systems and so on. So the latest version is 7.18, but it's a, a kind of, they stop maintaining. There was a clone of that called Veracrypt. So people who like, love TrueCrypt use that Veracrypt right now. But their format is kind of different. The TrueCrypt files, I think, cannot mount with Veracrypt files and so on, I like that. And then there is the other package called Lux, which used by the Linux people to have encrypted volumes and the hard disk. So maybe for those, one of these tools, if you use Windows, of course, BitLocker, one of these tools you can use uh, to kind of uh, encrypt the data. Right, now comes for the kind of networking. How do you have anonymous communication? So when you connect to a web server, obviously web server knows where you come from. Sometimes you don't need to reveal that to a web server. You want to anonymously connect to them. So anonymizing idea started before the World Wide Web. Actually, the first ever kind of application on the internet is email. You know, in the 80s, we, don't, we didn't have web, we had email. So anonymizing idea introduced with that email 
calling Mixnet in 1980s, before World Wide Web. So the idea is having different mail servers. So you hide to your recipients through those mail servers. And then the destination mail server doesn't know where this mail come from. So later on, this idea expanded to the <coughs> web. And that concept, we call it as onion routing. With the onion routing, we can kind of preserve or do, or preserve our privacy plus do anonymous browsing. So then the web servers may not be able to trace us. Plus people at the middle may not be able to block our communication. So onion routing is nicely implemented in a project called Tor. So maybe you heard about this Tor project. In this Tor project, so there is a browser called Tor Browser. So actually it's a Firefox browser. So they have used that in the Tor, Tor bundle. So using the Tor Browser, you can connect to the different websites or any websites in the world through a Tor network. Tor is a voluntary network which implemented anonymous browsing. Let's see how the Tor works. So here you are the Tor client and people will run what they call it as Tor routers voluntarily. Over the internet, I think around 1,000 Tor routers running right now. And then there are web servers you want to talk. So then you type, uh, start your Tor client. First they connect to a directory which runs on this Tor network and get uh, Tor router information. So then, and the key which used by this particular Tor router, Tor, uh, Tor router. So then you connect to this Tor router and say, I want to go to a particular server kind of, I want to establish the Tor circuit. Actually this Tor client say, I want to establish a Tor circuit with maybe three nodes or four nodes based on the configuration of the client. So you connect to an initial router and test that. So then that router randomly pick another router on the network and give that key of the router to you. So then you have the key of initial router and then you have a key of the second router. So then if you say you want to have three hop to a circuit, so that the second router will introduce you the third router and give you the pass the third key. So then you have three different keys of three different routers and you establish a, what they call it as store circuit. After that, you say you want to access a page that is a get request, web get request. So that request actually encrypted to the end user three times with three different keys. So this is in the middle of your request encrypted with K1, K2 and K3. And these multiple encrypted requests passes to the first router. Then first router will remove the outer encryption, passes the request to the second router. Second router will remove the outer encryption, passes to the third router. Third router remove that outer encryption. So he get then pure get request then passes to the server. So then server responds to the final router. So this guy doesn't know who you are plus, and this guy doesn't know kind of the other. So he know only the rex. So through the circuit established, the response come back to you. So it's called as to, to prana. So there is a method, res, re, uh, a uh, message encrypted with several keys. And any of the routers, they have no idea about, except the last router, what is your request? And even the last router may does not know who you are because that information is hidden to him. So using that, you can do fully anonymized browsing. 
Right. So the next, but I want to move on to the other topic, what we call open source intelligence. Before I move on, maybe the people, some people may not know about Tor. So for them, I will show you the uh, Tor browser. So maybe I will uh, share the uh, desktop. Uh, this is my Tor browser bundle. So it will start the Tor browser. So as some of you may know, in some uh, downloads has blocking some websites. Uh, so if you store, so downloads may not see because they're encrypted. So for example, in the Sri Lankan government, uh, these days both, uh, block uh, a website called uh, lankainews.com. Uh, this is a kind of a, a, a news website which is blocked by the Sri Lankan government authorities. So but if you go through the tour, it goes. So we can kind of, uh, read that. Why it goes through this uh, tone network? Because the Sri Lankan government or the ISP firewalls, they may not see that because they, they get encrypted data. So when you click that icon there, you see how that tone tongue goes. So I am a tour client. This browser actually connected to an initial router in Germany, guarded router. So that German router talked to another router in Germany. That router talked to the router in the United States. That United States router actually contacted a website called this Lanka Inex. So then content comes to that, to the United States, German, German to this browser. So whoever monitoring in Sri Lanka, or whoever blocking those connections in Sri Lanka will see this particular browser talked to a German server that is kind of authorized. So then they let them to talk. But all this communication encrypted one after the other, then so the data comes through the surface to my browser. Nobody there will be able to trust me. And even People who work here to trace me may not see that, or they cannot stop this communication. So that is a very good tool. People can use uh, to kind of preserve their privacy plus to bypass different uh, kind of internet blockage and internet kind of blocking things uh, implemented by different government and organizations. I think most of you listen to me knows about this store one, right. Okay, let's move on to open source intelligence. So that is little old topic, but that may not get good attention from the cybersecurity communities yet, but this topic is there, people do do, do this, but not kind of formalize really and not get good attention yet. The open source intelligence defined in such a way it says, so if you use openly available data to gather the intelligent information, that call it as open source intelligence. It is legal. It is not illegal because this information has put on to the cyberspace by you voluntarily. So then people who gather in that information, which users put it into the cyberspace, people use different tools to collect that and build actionable intelligent things. So then the people who build that intelligent things are not doing any illegal thing. They are not hacking to your servers. They are not kind of uh, doing man in the middle, no. 
they are using the information which you have put it into the cyberspace to learn about you. So how do you put that information? Maybe accidentally you put it, maybe you don't know you have already put that, maybe voluntarily you have put those information. So that is interesting subject. So in the in theoretically open source intelligence has a kind of five states. In the first state, what we call it as identifying the sources. So there we discuss where you can find this information. So we need to have some target. We need to create a report, intelligent report about a person, a company, or maybe a report to a government, or maybe a report to any other organization. So final objective here is to create an intelligent report. So in order to achieve that final state, first of all, you need to identify where can I collect this information? From which social network website or by which, which group or which country or which organization? So first of all, you have to identify the source. The next thing is harvesting the information. Then you need to find it out, those information, getting this information from those source. So for that, mainly we can use search engines. There are different search engines we can use to gather those information. After harvesting, we go into processing state. So we might house the information from different, different source, which not correlate each other. But we can kind of putting those information together and process it to do something that is analyzing. So we process that information to get a meaningful independent data sets, and then we put them all to the analysis state. In the analysis states, we join those information together to create or to get the information we need or to generate the report we need. So that is the theoretical process of OSIN. Right. So with the OSIN, OSIN collect information from where? From which kind of documents? So let's discuss it a little bit. So it's from cyberspace. Of course, it's from cyberspace. In the cyberspace, maybe most of the time it's from web applications. We gather this open source data, open data from web application. So in the web or the cyberspace, especially on the web, you might know there are three kinds of web we have today. So what we call it as surface web, deep web, and dark web. Surface web is the regular web we see, the web we know, know it the web we use for day to day. So we can say the web as we know, it's a surface web. So then there is what we call it as deep web. Deep web is the web we all have access to. That means in order to get the content of the deep web, you need to log in. If you, after you type username and the password, you access your content, your personalized content, that is what we call deep web. Because without using your username or password, someone else can access the deep web, but the provider of that software can access everybody's information. For them, it is not a deep web. So for example, if you use Gmail, so Gmail content is deep web for end users, but for Google, it's not. Google is a surface web because Google see all the information in it for all users. Then dark web. Dark web is where the darkness or the bad thing goes on. So how do you run a dark web website? There are different techniques. Again, in the dark web, Tor is the main technology used there. So we will discuss those dark web Later on, we are 
organizing other course called uh, ethical hacking uh, somewhere I think there is a poor could remember the name and uh, time I think in somewhere in September there is another close plan so there we have we'll discuss in detail so so what, what do you think what do you think which web is larger surface web deep web or dark web which contribute to the larger content when you think about basically uh, surface web That is the index web, by, that is the data index by search engines. The access is maybe securely using DLS, maybe not. But maybe you think it's the larger web, majority, actually no. Surface, so most of the open source intelligence tools actually collect information from the surface web. But in the deep end, so some researchers say 94% or 90% over the cyber content is actually deep a protected by username and the password. Maybe we say can it's relatively secure comparing to the service web. It is used by the people. Of course, it's not for bad things. So in the deep web, everything behind the username and the password basically is deep. So in case you can get some username and the access tokens of the users, we can use deep web content to do the OS inter as well. But most of the OS setting can actually focus on so far. That is six percent roughly. And how about dark web? Dark web, we don't know. We don't know how much content is there, whether maybe it's secure. And it is used by most of the time bad guys, maybe terrorists, maybe some drug dealers, and so on. So we don't know. We don't know how, how, how do they work because it's completely hidden, completely hidden internet. So there they use Tor and some other technologies that we discuss later on. So most of the open source tools what I discussed today actually applies to the surface web. In the surface web, if you want to get something, what we do is searching, search engines. So you know there are so many search engines in the world, uh, Google, Bing, Yahoo are kind of popular search engines. So those search engines, we could use to gather the intelligent information. Plus, when you search on using those search engines, they gather the information about you. These companies take the information about you as well. So. Uh, have you ever visited this website, myactivitygoogle.com? So if not, go to that site, myactivity.google.com and check what they have recorded. So they may record all of your activity you have done on your cyberspace. So they said that's only visible to you. They said they are keeping it in the Deep web. That is correct at this time. But who knows? In the next day, someone else may take your password by doing man in the middle attack. So then that particular person also has access to this. Now. So, so that may create problems on. on, on you as well. If you want to stop that, there is a place where you can stop and telling the Google, don't trace me under Google preferences. But most of the us, most of us are not doing it. So especially security professionals who don't want to trace, who don't want to see open source intelligent tools are using uh, use your data 
they are not using Google. Instead, so they go to some other search engine called DuckDuckGo. Maybe you heard about it, some of you are maybe using it. That is famous among security professionals, where they may not gather any personal information while you search. So if you want to kind of do search to get some information, kind of do open source integration on top of some other people, maybe you can use that that book. Of course, maybe you can use Google. So, but if you use Google, you should know what your action is recorded. So when you use Google to gather the personal information, so we call it as Google hacking. Now we call it as Google Docs. So Google, perhaps you know, has what we call it as advanced search parameters. So those parameters can nicely combine each other to find it out. So many informations about people, about websites, about credentials, and so and so. So for example, if you want to find it out, maybe usernames, let's say usernames which is stored on some documents. So you can use an advanced search option called file type and give that same PDF which says search the username keyword only available on this PDF. So then Google will give you the list of PDF files which consist of these usernames. So maybe you can specify that further using maybe uh, maybe uh, another advanced search option called site. So for example, let's uh, go to Google. Maybe since I share my uh, desktop, you can see that. Uh, and then you say type uh, find usernames from file type uh, PDF, that's Google only uh, return, sorry. Uh, returns PDF, which has, you see, file types. All of them are kind of PDF documents. Right, so if you want to kind of uh, restrict that search to a particular domain, you can say site from maybe uh, uh, our LK websites, let's say sites from Sri Lankan websites. So then say, give me the files PDF which consists of username from LK websites. So it's all the documents will comes to the related to LK. So maybe you interest maybe financial information, maybe salary of some salary information. Maybe they, as we can assume they are in Excel sheets perhaps. Uh, maybe we can run a query like that. So you see it re returns some annexes, uh, budget estimations, and some other uh, maybe forms. Who knows some of these information may confidential and accidentally released to the web. So like that, we can run personalized queries. So that queries have Google Docs, advanced queries, sorry, advanced queries. So for those advanced queries create, can use to gather information from the private uh, open space. So some of these advanced queries operators I have listed down, like in title we search the keywords in the title, and URL, L, all in title, all in URL, sites, all in index, file types, in subject like that, site, 
uh, and like that there are operators available advanced operators so so in title search for, for the page title and it applied for the web images groups and names and all in title search page title and that's applied for this all in title means that words all all the words is in the title not part of the optional words and like in url and if you exactly want to match all in url and then sites specify the sites domain names uh, search text only the text and then file types in subject like subject uh, uh, group or subject search like in title in the web and then it's applied for groups so those search parameters using those advanced search parameters we can build several advanced queries those advanced queries will reveal so many personal information so even so very simply even maybe images for example let's search on me and go to the images so you see they have identified me personally of course there are some other photos but most of the photos they have indexes so some of these photos even i don't know how do they get it so but you see there are photos they have already indexed so if you know about some person name you can just search so in there there are some uh, settings and also more so like that you can kind of uh, uh, search personal things like you know, this this is search settings advanced search, search activities and things like that so we can set the search settings and uh, in this uh, uh, language and maybe search activities uh, and things like that you can try those things uh, you see you can uh, you can uh, build customized search like they, they suggest maybe you search for which kind maybe student called custom like that so you see uh, so they they give different results then academic staff so you see thousands works on universities like that so so basically uh, you know uh, so even the simple image search may reveal so many personal data right then there is other search engine that's about google so there are some other search engines away which may give some information maybe you heard about this view so that is called as clustering search engine so when you go to this website you can kind of search some topics people this search engine is automatically cluster them into group cluster them into different sources sites times and the topics so as you may see i'm searching on this ips my name so they have customized the information on the world world published information into those topics or the clusters of automatically and group the search in result into several groups so that is very interesting if i do os int so then this tool will kind of group the data i don't want to look at all the information i can look at the groups which i am interested in more. so then i know the person called kasun and i know he is working from university of columbia ucsc so then i can search there to find it out his information i don't need to look at kasun pereira or someone else so then it could help me to gather clusters information if search engine
Then there are not only these online search engines, there are some tools available. Have you heard about Harvester? So that is an interesting tool. You can harvest some information from the web using this command line tool. So for example, if you want to harvest information about University of Colombia, so you can run the harvester saying the harvester minus D, give me the information which relate, relate to this domain. In order to gather that information, use first 500 queries of Google. So the harvesters use existing search engines. So what the harvester do, inject queries to the existing search engines and gather all the search results and then from that result, they harvest the information we want, such as email address, servers, IP addresses, and things like that belongs to a particular organization. That is a very interesting tool in the OS team. So let me run this harvester query on the terminal. So that tool you can easily implement, uh, install on the uh, uh, Ubuntu or the Linux based OS, but it's a Python because Python too. I think because of that, it can run on the Windows as well. So you, I say that Harvester search on the University of Colombo on Google, collect first 500 search results and analyze it and give the information, all the information available in those 500 search hittings to me. So then it give me a simple report, even I can save them in the hard disk. There are several options available. So you see, it's just a few minutes. They search it and say these email addresses are exposed to the open space. So that means these people who listed here will get a lot of spams, a lot of unwanted mails because they are visible. Maybe those people who want those email addresses may not be aware of it. So that is visible. And then those hosts are exposed. So these IP addresses are available to the open public. So then we can find it out which kind of servers belongs to this organization running in the open space. Like that, we could collect, harvest some information, basic information which required for further searching using this simple tool. So that is kind of another offline, a kind of online tool, which command line tool, which can be used for OSIN. Right. Have you heard about Soda? So that is another interesting search engine. So usually you know Google search documents. Soda and search devices. So using the Soda, so you can search devices connected to the internet. What kind of devices? Routers, webcams, Maybe, of course, devices are computers as well, and switches, so many devices. <coughs> we can search those devices using Soda. Maybe I show you. Let's go to this website. So done, I think so done, I don't know. Yes, in the previous week was for so done, headquarters home. So the same so done, I use. Search engines for buildings, webs, starter networks, and so on. So they have some paid version which gives more results. And uh, so you can have a simple so done search as well. Uh, so for example, maybe we say getting started. So they will say kind of 
queries which people run on. Uh, so you see, uh, so maybe if you want to search on webcams connected to, so you see these webcams. Uh, so some of these webcams may have default passwords. So like, so they connected to those cams and show the places of those. Uh, so we can actually go to the webcam as well. I think directly we can uh, uh, click this. Uh, this is in Italy, however. So maybe let's say this webcam I want to connect. And so you see uh, it's running in this port, city, country, and so on. Uh, IP address is here given. Uh, maybe I go to this IP address to see whether it's running uh, on public. Some of these may have a default username and the password. That's the other dangerous thing. So if they are running with the default username and the password, perhaps that bad guys might search on that and then perhaps log into your webcam and then maybe uh, do various things. Uh, maybe look it at and things like that. So maybe let's say we go this, for example. So since it came, maybe it's offline. Uh, it is offline, maybe we can go to this. Like that you can try, you can try not only uh, webcams, there are so many uh, devices uh, we can trace on, there are maps, and even we can run this order in queries uh, based on kind of the heat maps. Uh, they show which area has that, uh, but some in order to use some services, you have to pay for some services actually free. Uh, so like that, you can actually use such search engines uh, to gather open source, uh, open intelligence. Right. Uh, that is soda. Then, how do you know about census? I you? This is another search engine. We search for devices. It search only kind of devices and there are kind of error codes and there are service codes like that. So for example, if you want to find the uh, servers which run Telnet and FTP on LK domain, you can run this query. You say location country code is LK and protocols is Telnet and FTP. Some people are still running that. FTP, you know, FTP is not secure uh, server anymore, it's SSH, but some people are running FTP servers. So by using such search engines, you can gather this open information. They are not kind of hacked. So they are the information and publish, securitize their service on the internet. So those search engines gather those banner data and index that, so then people can search. So for example here, let's I search on, uh, let's I search on uh, this search query. And then, say search. So you see it stays. So there are servers in these places where they run uh, SSS, FTP, Telnet, you know, it's open, open ports. These ports are open on those servers. You can get, I think, more detail there. The location of the server and network ID and other, other information, the running information. So it's kind of it's index. So using that, people might search 
people can collect information. So this is no no hacking or no unethical, no unlawful things there. Those information out there on the cyberspace. So those searching tools just index. So what we do is just search. Similarly, if you use any social networks, so there are plenty of tools available to gather the information. For example, I have given set of websites here to do some intelligent gathering on Twitter. So, so this Twitter stat will give us statistics information of Twitter. My Twitter birthday will tell us when the Twitter account starts and so on. And then social graphs will show the social graphs of connections with other people. Like can analyze will tell us how many likes this Twitter account has and then so on. Like that, there are plenty of tools available on the internet where you can analyze and Twitter, similar to the Facebook, similar to the Facebook. So using those online tools, you can gather information which is public or already published. So that is what we call OSIN, Gathering Open Intelligence. Have you know about this website? True code. So that used by most of the people to identify unwanted calls. So when you install true call on your mobile phones, so if someone calls you, even that person's phone number is not available in your address book, the true caller might tell who is that person. How do they tell so? So whenever you install this true caller, so they will take your address book. Actually, they take with your consent because your objective is using true caller to trace unwanted calls. So you voluntarily give your address book, donate your personal data to true caller, true caller use that data to provide the service. So actually, I'm not using true caller, but if I tried my phone number, True caller knows that. How someone else who has my number in his address book is using the true call. So especially open source intelligent people use that true caller to trace people using a phone number. So if someone, if I know some phone number and want to know who is that person, so we can type that in true caller and true caller will tell who is that person is. So in one side, those websites and tools which I show you is serious privacy problems. On the other side, since those tools, websites and services collected this information, we can use to gather the intelligent information. So that area is called open source intelligence. The other one is called privacy. So since the, uh, these services violating our privacy, we can do open source intelligence. If they don't really kind of respect our privacy, then there are no subjects called open source intelligence. Not only the companies, we as personally, we have to respect ourselves. So that means, as I mentioned, most of this personal information, private information, given to those web servers or those companies voluntarily by you and me. So then, because we have given those information to them, of course, they use it for marketing purpose and make money. On the other side, some other people, Use that to trace you. Use that to locate you. Use that to profile you, and so on. So that is a serious problem. So what we have to do is you have to think. You have to think. You have to concern. 
you have to think and concern there is a call privacy and you should not reveal your personal information to those companies plus you should know there are tools available people might use those tools to trace you on and that may has an impact that you might then think seriously before exposing those information to the web. So that's what I want to do in this lecture. I want to kind of force you not to reveal personal information to the cyberspace. And I would like to ask you to respect your personal information yourself. If everybody do so, so we can't do open source intelligence. So how do you access the dark web? Actually, most of the part of the dark web will be using Tor network. So in order to access the dark web, we ha you have to use Tor browser, Tor browser. And darknet servers running as what we call as Tor hidden services. So since this lecture get too long, I have stripped out that. Right, so dark web services are mainly Tor services, so accessed by the Tor browser. So, which I show today is the anonymous view of one direction that is, you hide yourself from the servers where servers cannot trace. Dark web is the other side, server hide themselves where people cannot trace. So, then this dark web web server where those servers run no way to trace. So that is the opposite of Tor, which is supported by Tor. The access, how to access the app is mainly using Tor, Tor network. When you use Gmail like open web systems, so obviously these mails are visible to the third parties, including the Gmail. So if you want to hide them, how to do that, I will take it in my uh, next two lectures. So you can follow that there. I will let you know how to write encrypted mails. So even nobody can trace. So if you encrypt the mail, even some dark web or some bad guy take it from the Gmail, they cannot access that because only you have the key to access it. So that's the only way kind of protected it. How do they hack Gmail is usually, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they, they are different techniques of hacking it. Uh, so, Somehow they might take it and may, they might collect it in this dark web websites and eventually somebody in the dark web has exposed that to the surface web. That might happen. So we are trusting those companies. So those companies obviously can see those information. So if you have serious concerns about that, don't store those on these online services. Google Drive, Dropbox and things like that. So the problem is two things. First thing is, so obviously these companies using it, however, they may not blackmail you, but they silently use it for marketing purpose. That's one thing. Other thing is, eventually your password get hacked by someone else. So then they might go to those Dropbox or the Google Drive and take the confidential data there. So for example, let's say you store some confidential photo on Dropbox, but assuming only nobody will access it. So obviously not till your password is not revealed, but we are not sure that might happen when. So if that someone has taken, so then the inf information on this cloud servers are taken by the bad guys. So that's why I said, think twice before storing sensitive information on those cloud service providers or cloud storage. If you store that, maybe you can encrypt and store it. You encrypt it locally. I have shown how to encrypt that and then perhaps push to those. So then you, you can only decrypt it because you know the keys and you can then download and decrypt and access that. If you put it as plain text regular data, then obviously there is a risk. Use encryption tools, 
So if you have a sensitive data, always encrypt and keep it on your local storage as well as cloud storage. So that is the only thing we can do. And then oh, the toe has two sides. So obviously bad guys use so, and also good guys use so to go kind of hide themselves against uh, different governments and different people who trace you on you and so always there are two sides of talk. So I present it as a good side. Uh, the talk can use as a bad, bad side, like to run in dark code as well, which I am not going to talk. There is a talk, uh, you, you start a talk, there is a preference page where you can set the number of circuits, number of uh, bulbs. The talk client, when you start, there is a uh, uh, settings. So in that settings, you, you can check the, uh, you can change the hops, number of hops. So when, when the first comes, response comes to the first end router, so that will claim. So then it encrypt to the second router and then encrypt to the other and finally to, finally to the final, final destination that is your browser. So other way around, the same, 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 same way around to the other side. Request in one order, response is in the other order, encryption. Tor browser is just uh, Firefox. So what you, what interesting is the, so to, how do you do Tor circuit? I have explained that. Basically in the Tor uh, encrypt the, uh, establish the encrypted session between your browser to the destination in between several middle nodes. Uh, so because of those encryption at the middle nodes, no one will see to whom you are talking to, plus you, no one will see the content, which, which is inside of your communication. So as I explained, Tor is used for good things as well as bad things. Like people use Tor to escape from government sensations, like internet blockage and so on. So people, some governments in some organization, you know, some companies uh, cut down, the internet services and block that. So then the good people may use to go against that using Tor. And then good people may use to go untraced. So for example, some governments or some organization may, may study or may monitoring who is come to some website, some maybe anti-government website. So government may monitor and see which IP address comes to that website to monitor which part of the people which go against them and so on like that. So if people use Tor to come to that server, so then this interesting party may not get this information because that information scattered everywhere in the world like that. Tor can use for that, time, that purposes as well. So again, the bad guy is Tor to run what we call it as reverse order to run Tor hidden services to sell the bad things like drugs and so on. Maybe you heard about uh, Silk Road that is actually caught and there are several other uh, uh, dark websites available, popular marketplaces where people do bad things. So as I mentioned, I'm delivering it not from that angle, the other angle. So I don't want to talk about uh, Tor hidden services. If you're interested, you can find it yourself. And um, so basically, you know, we, we, we are using those services, accounts and so on. So we share those. So the problem is, so when you share it, maybe someone as we share may misuse it. So there are no any kind of to stop that. So for example, I might share. So other, other thing people forget about like, so a friend of mine today, maybe my enemy tomorrow. So. So we don't know. There are not always kind of permanent friends or the permanent enemies in the world. So if I, I may trust people, some person today and share some information with them, and tomorrow he might use that against me. How to stop? I don't know. It's kind of not possible. So you have to think about, before sharing, you have to think about, don't do it or something like that. Or otherwise maybe only you, you have to find some legal legal case, find some legal case. So if, it is in, if he is in a different country, 
that cannot be done as well. So it's you are helpless, kind of. So the best thing is think about before sharing. So don't share the confidential information. So some countries has laws. So even now Sri Lanka, if there are laws, uh, so if you take a illegal copy, so then you can uh, go to the police and complain it, and then there are kind of punishments. So, and I think in Sri Lanka is kind of, there are some fine from 30,000 or something like that. And if someone is hacked into the server and kind of get the data, then there is a, another punishment like that. In Sri Lanka, there are laws now for pirated software plus for illegal access of the content. I'm not aware about situation in Bangladesh and Nepal and things like that in other countries. In South Asia. In Sri Lanka, I don't have privacy laws yet, but uh, I think most of the Asian countries may also not have privacy laws. But Europe is the prominent in this domain and they have GDPR is there. So that created a lot of, uh, lot, of, lot of effect to the software companies. Plus that is, I think, uh, make European people much safer compared to the Asian people. So for example, if you use any client-side encryption and encrypt that, so you need to remember their keys. You need to get a copy of those keys. So if you forget those keys, even you cannot recover. So that is how they, how they create the software to protect your information. They give, let only you to recover. So if you forget about it, so you have to forget about the data. That is the negative side of it encryption so i i uh, try to explain that in detail as well so for example i i mentioned that so you you upload some your right you for example let's say you tag some you user on the privacy network so tagging some names or the faces of the people you expose that person saying he is cousin or he is niranjan right so then after that so those networks may use that information to tag him further. So, and then maybe do some targeted marketing or maybe use that information and show that information to kind of social tools which do that and maybe they show the social links and they might sell this data to some data analytic companies like that. So, that is the problem which we are, we are talking about. So you give your personal information like your name, date of birth and photos and photos of your friends, photos of your families and photos of your mother, father, brothers and everything to the social network website. So then they might build family trees. Uh, so you are kind of, uh, your personal interest, uh, you are kind of, uh, other, other detail and so many private information they might leak, sell, or expose to the world. So it's, this is a real risk. So that's what I'm going to explain to you and convince you. So usually in the Asian part of the world, we are not care about too much of our private information. So we take it lightly, but time taken, time has, now, right time, I think, to think even Asian people, as Asian people, we have to think about our privacy. We should not kind of open our entire life to the others. 